It's good to be back with you again today, and I appreciate your prayers. Took my last radiation Tuesday. Have a scan in, in April, and then we hope we're we're done. And uh, Glenn, I just don't have as pretty a head as you do, so I need hair to cover mine. I'm... Happy birthday, John. What are you, 65 now? It's about 20 years. <laughs> That's great. Let's bow together. Father, we come to worship you, and the song causes us to ponder, why do you love us so? It's not because of merit on our part that we are deserving of your love and your grace and your mercy. It's not because of efforts on our part that we earn your love and your mercy and your grace. It's because of who you are, our creator, our sustainer, our savior, our Lord. And you are worthy of our worship, not just this hour on Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and every place that we go and everything that we do and in the midst of all of our thoughts about our work, about our family, about our hobbies and habits, in the midst of every aspect of our life, there is you. There you are found. There is your concern and love for us. And there should be our worship of you. We thank you that in your love you sent your Son and that in your Son Jesus we have the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. And in Christ Jesus we have newness of life to live each day serving you by helping and serving others. Teach us to be like him in all that we do and accept our offerings of worship and praise. In the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, the, the second chapter of Luke. These three dates will forever be etched into my memory as days of immense joy. September 28, 1980, December 31st, 1982, and February the 11th, 1984. Those are the birth dates of our three children. The birth of each child brought us great joy. It also brought us a tremendous amount of work and effort in the years since. I can never, however, forget the first time I held each of them. They were so small and so cute. Well, let me correct that for a minute. Neither of the boys were small. They came half grown. And the oldest one was definitely not cute. He was an ugly baby. I'm sorry to have to say that. But if we brought a newborn picture, you would go, that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. And, but the third one, she was small and, and she was precious and incredibly cute. And they brought joy to our lives. And I knew at that moment that I held each one of them for the first time that I would do anything for them, anything to provide and to protect them, anything. If you've had children, you know what I mean. There's immediately a bond, a biting bond that's deep, and it's still there in your heart today, though they may be grown as ours, ours are. And it's a good thing that deep bond is present because that little bundle of joy is going to be responsible for long hours of lost sleep, unbelievably bad odors, <laughs> and never-ending demands. You will spend the first year of your life urging that child to walk and talk in the next four years wishing it would sit down and shut up. 
<laughs> this is the experience of welcoming a new baby and getting it up to about age four. There's very little in the Bible that talks about this stage of the development of life. What you do find there most of the time is just a simple reference, a notation that infants and children were present in whatever was happening. And usually the infants will be referred to in the mother, in the arms of their mothers. Or reference will be made to infants or small children as an illustration of the immaturity and weakness of the people of God. For example, several of the prophets speaking for God say, I carried you like a nursing infant, referring to how God had protected and provided for them in their weakness. Mothers and infants are also referred to in judgment oracles. And I think it's a way of emphasizing the terror of judgment. Because we men can sometimes think something bad's going to happen and we start thinking immediately about how we're going to overcome this. We're going to be stronger than that. But the idea of our wives and our babies caught in that just brings a whole different sense and feeling to it. Psalm 8 says, from the mouths of babies you have established your strength, referring to how God's truth sometimes comes to us from the most unlikely of sources. That's about it. That's about all you get in the Bible in reference to infancy, with the exception of the birth of Jesus. Now, of the birth of Jesus, we get told a pretty good bit about him, mainly in the Gospel of Luke. As a matter of fact, if you have really read and studied the Gospels, you realize that in Mark and in John, there's nothing about the birth of Jesus. Zero, zilch, nothing. It's only from Matthew and Luke that we know anything about his birth, and only from Luke do we get some of the details of what Mary experienced, which has led biblical scholars to conclude that the good Dr. Luke, as he was researching to write his gospel, he met Mary and he interviewed her. That is the interview of all ages, to have talked with the mother of Jesus and learned her story. But other than just really some very brief passages about his birth, there's virtually nothing about those birth to age three or four. There's virtually nothing about him in those years. The exception to that is found in the Gospel of Luke where it says that Mary and Joseph, when he was just a few days old, went to the temple to fulfill the requirements of the law. And then while they were there at the temple, uh, they met a man, an old man named Simeon, who had been waiting for the coming of the Messiah and in the Holy Spirit knew that that's who this baby was. And he praised God and he blessed them. And then a prophetess named Anna, whose husband had died when she was they were newly married, and she had been 84 years without a husband. And the Bible says she spent most of her time in the temple praying and praising God. And she too was given insight from the Holy Spirit about who this infant was. And then from all of that, you then get this one verse, Luke chapter 2, verse 40. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's it. That's all we're told about the process of raising Jesus as a very small child. This brief description ends with this one general statement. But there's so much more to birth to about age three or four. Developmental skills that happen in those brief years lay the foundation for everything that comes in the years that will follow. These development skill, developmental skills are cognitive, they are emotional, they are social, and they are important motor skills. The child has to learn to trust. The child has to learn to listen.
The child has to learn to speak. The child has to learn to walk and to manipulate things. All of these things. Parents become fixated on these developmental tasks with the first child. A little less with the second child. A very much less with the third child. And if there's a fourth child, they'll hardly notice. They will take a thousand photos of the first child. They'll take 400 photos of the second child. For the third, they may take 40. And if there's a fourth, they may take four. But that goes to illustrate why there's so little in the Bible about these years. Because it's commonplace. Once you've seen it, once you've experienced it, it's commonplace. It's happening all the time, all around us. It always has and it always will as long as life is on this planet. The bringing of a child in this world and nurturing that child up to about age three or four, it's happening all the time. And it's so commonplace, we hardly notice except when there's something extraordinary. And usually that means there's something wrong. I have a special needs little sister. Now she's well into her 50s now. Years ago when my parents moved into a retirement community and we moved them out of their house, they had a big filing cabinet and um, they didn't want it and so we took it home. It's, it's in our garage and eventually I started going through the papers that were in there. And in there were these huge files. They were full of information about my little sister and my mother's desperate efforts to find out what was wrong with her. To get a diagnosis and get the help that she needed. And talking with my older brothers and sisters, because Laura's the fifth, I'm number four of five kids, everything changed. Their experience, my oldest brother and older sister, is vastly different from my and my brother just older than my experience. And the change, the difference, was when Laura was born. And when Laura was born, my mother became so focused on finding out what was wrong with her and finding the help that she needed, well, her mother moved in with us. And she was like a mother figure to myself and to my brother Howard. And then my sister Phyllis became like a mother figure to me in those early adolescent years. Because that's how our family coped when things weren't normal, when things weren't right. A pediatrician will give growth charts and they'll tell you what are the percentile numbers of a small child's growth. And you want your child to be normal or above. Except there's one problem with that. There's no such thing as normal. It doesn't really exist. Normal is really not found anywhere except in this way. No two children develop alike and develop at the same pace. That's what normal is. That they're all different. History takes little note of the birth and growth of small children. The Bible takes little note of the birth and the growth of small children except for special circumstances. You're really only told about three. Moses, Samuel, and Jesus. We only are told about the birth and something brief about their early years of those three. Nevertheless, the growth and development of the small child is as much a part of God's plan for human life as the growth and the development of the child in the womb and the growth and development of a child as they enter school or the adolescence or us in adulthood. Every aspect of that development is of design. It's not because of the fall that Adam and Eve sinned and then we had the struggle of growth and development. No, the order to, the command to be fruitful and multiply came before the fall. And if they had not sinned and when Eve had, would have brought a child into this world, that child would not have been born grown. 
That child would have been born as an infant and would have had to have grown and developed just as we have to grow and develop. And every stage and step of growth and development is part of God's plan. Thus, He is glorified when we as human beings work to successfully achieve the development process that He's placed before us. But an infant is unique in each one of these processes. An infant cannot do for themselves. An infant has to achieve certain things but cannot do it alone. A small child is utterly dependent upon its parents. Thus, when parents are meeting the needs of a small child, of infants and toddlers, it pleases God, brings glory to God, and it recognizes His purposes in our lives. And when parents or adults fail to do this, it is shameful and it is sinful. Here's one of the interesting things about nature. Human babies are incompetent. They're totally incompetent. This drives the environmentalist, the uh, evolutionist crazy. Well, why does that fact drive the evolutionist crazy? Because a central law of evolution is survival of the fittest. Evolution says the blind selection of the strongest and the survivors to then thrive is why you have the order we have among the species on the earth. But human babies can not survive. They cannot. Of all of the animals on earth, human babies are the most helpless, the weakest, and the most incompetent that are brought into life. They are utterly dependent upon adults. And not just for a few days or a few weeks or a few months, but for years. They are utterly dependent upon adults. This is unlike anywhere else in nature. They are the weakest. They are the most helpless. And they are the most incompetent of all creatures. Last year news was made in San Diego, at San Diego Zoo, when uh, a baby hippo was born. A baby hippo born in captivity is rare. Of necessity, that baby hippo was walking and swimming within hours of its birth. In the wild, it couldn't survive if it did not have the ability to walk and swim almost immediately. A baby crocodile is hatched from its egg. It has to swim immediately or it's become somebody's dinner. It won't survive. In the same way, a horse, when born, will get up on their feet and walk within minutes of its birth. It has to, to survive. The same is true of a giraffe. The same is true of an elephant. Elephant, go on YouTube and look for it and you can see short videos of these animals being born and then within minutes they are up on their feet and they are walking. But how long does it take a newborn baby to walk? A year is not unusual. More than a year is not unusual. Infants can actually swim before they can walk but they can't survive because they can't get out of the water. You can put them in there in their swim, but they're going to drown because they're going to get tired. Without someone else to get them out of the water, they cannot survive. A human infant requires almost round-the-clock care to survive. It is weak, helpless, and incompetent. The parents have to be there. This defies the logic of the law of the survival of the fittest. How can the animal least fit for survival in life rise to the very top of the evolutionary chain? How can that happen? 
The evolutionists don't like that question. But they have an answer. They have an explanation. Their explanation is because the parents care for the child. But why do the parents care for the child? They have an answer. When the little baby hippo was born in the San Diego Zoo, it had an oversized head and oversized eyes. It was adorable. It was so cute. It became an internet succession, a success, and people r rushed to the zoo to see this newborn baby hippo. Now, the hippo is the most dangerous animal on earth in the wild. More human beings are killed by hippos than by lions or tigers or bears. They are extremely dangerous. We see a big hippo, there ain't nothing cute there at all. But a baby hippo, because of its oversized head and oversized eyes, is cute. It's adorable. That is the explanation the in evolutionists give. That almost all young have oversized heads and oversized eyes. And when the parents see they are attracted. They say, it's cute. I think I'll help this thing survive. Moms, that is evolution's total explanation for why you care for your children. Because it's cute. You and I know it's more than that. It's more than just the fact that the head's a little big and the eyes are big. It's not just cuteness. It's design. It's the design of a creator. It's the design of God who placed within us an instinct to care, protect, and provide for that child. And a human child has no hope for survival without it. Your love and care for your babies when they came along was nothing more than just your thinking it's cute. It was a God-given desire to nurture and love. It, was a, it is a command of God in Scripture. It is not an accident. Psalm 127 says children are a blessing from the Lord and that the person who has children is blessed of God. <coughs> children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior or children born in one's youth, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Children are a blessing, a blessing from God. And we are charged by God to protect and to provide for them. And it's not a charge just given to children who are perfect. It's to all children. There's a form of genocide taking place in the world as we speak. Down syndrome children are being aborted in record numbers. They're predicting the extinction of Down syndrome children in the not too distant future. Last year, Gerber Baby Food Company chose a Downs infant as a poster child. Absolutely adorable child. The outcry was loud and sickening. Protesting, how dare they put this imperfect child up as a poster child. All infants, whether perfect or not, are blessings from God. And infants are our responsibility, not just the mothers, all of us. There are very specific developmental tasks for that newborn, tasks they cannot complete by themselves because they're helpless and needy. How are they helpless? They can't find food. They can't feed themselves. They can't find shelter. They can't even deal with their own bodily function. Animals, right after birth, have instincts that teach them how to deal with their bodily functions. They don't have to be taught. They simply do it, but not a baby. An animal 
by instinct knows how to squat and then by instinct knows to move away from bodily waste. Not a human infant. A human infant will just let it go anywhere and everywhere and will wallow in it and play in it. That instinct is missing in humans and it has to be taught. And guess who gets to teach them? <laughs> you and I do. They are helpless and they are needy. And at this stage in life, they stink. But we love them. They need protection. Infants and small children are completely vulnerable. Even in the animal kingdom, the males, the dads, will show very little interest in the infant. However, if the infant is threatened, the male will place themselves between the threat and the infant and will growl or make other aggressive motions to tell whatever the threat is it needs to go away. And if it doesn't go away, the dad will then fight to protect them. And in nature, there is no fury to compare with the fury of a mama bear whose cubs are threatened. Our children were in Virginia and they had gone in the, in the mountains there up a stream um, where they had driven a ways and gotten out and walked a ways and they were fishing and wading in the beautiful mountain water that was coming down the mountain. And then they looked up and on their side of the river just down a little ways was a baby bear cub. Mama was somewhere nearby. Daddy, who almost always has a gun on him, had left the gun in the car. And they were very afraid, as they should have been. They crossed the river, took a long way around to get back to their car, all in fear every step of the way that they would meet Mama Bear, whose fury, when unleashed, is a terrifying thing. They need protecting infants do. And in the animal kingdom, nature instills that in them, in the dad and in the mom but also in the human kingdom. Your preschooler is vulnerable. In the tragic reality of this life in which we live today, there are people out there who will do unthinkable things to a small child if parents are not vigilant. But a small child also needs nurture, needs love, warmth, assurance, and care. In the Middle Ages, a debate arose about what would be the natural language a child would speak. The learned said it would be Latin. Latin would be the natural tongue of a child. But in order to find out, a little experiment was done in which some orphans were placed under care and the caregivers were instructed to not speak to them at all. And then they would wait to see what language they would naturally speak. These orphan infants got sick and died. It seems that the natural language of an infant is nurture and love. That is their language. And they have to have it, just like they need food and water. Babies need to be, be held. They need to be hugged. They need to be tickled. They need to see smiling, happy faces, hear warm, nurturing words, even though they can't understand them. They need that like they need food. We have a book, comes in a box, and Francis, I forget his name, has the little glove, something about tickling. And, and you sit with your child and you read the book, and then you use that gloved hand to tickle them as they read it. Our children absolutely loved that book. They wanted us to read it to them and tickle them with that gloved hand. Children need it. They need nurture. They also need to learn. Children, when they're young, need to learn the meaning of the word no. Discipline includes both affirmation and correction. When a young child does something right, they should be praised, they should be affirmed. But when a child is headed towards something harmful, harmful, that child needs immediate and effective correction. A young toddler does not need a lengthy lecture about electricity and the principles of, con of, of conductivity when the child's got a fork and is fixing to probe an outlet. What that child needs is a firm no and a good slap on the hand corrective action. 
We do not offer a child affirmation or corrective discipline because we fear the child may one day sin. It's because we know the child will one day sin. And we know that if the child does not learn self-discipline, sin will overwhelm them as an adolescent or a young adult. The goal of all discipline is self-discipline. To thrive, a child must learn this. We must teach him or her the difference between right or wrong. Failure to do so is catastrophic. In so many ways, the early development of a child is a model of the Christian life. This is what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 3. I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual men, but to as men of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. And then in the text we read from Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. Implied in this text is that in the Christian life, just as in human development, there's a journey. And that we start as infants in Christ and we must grow to maturity in Christ. It is a developmental process. Each stage appropriate to itself. What's abnormal is for someone who's been a Christian for years but is still not able to handle the solid truth of the gospel. That is what is abnormal. That is what is not right. In antiquity, not ancient antiquity, but in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages in Europe, children were treated as little adults. The paintings of children, they're dressed like adults, they're standing like adults, their faces are expressions like adults. And a sign that you were making it, achieving status, was to be able to afford a nanny to take care of your small children and then to be able to afford a boarding school to send them off to school until they're grown. Parents weren't involved in the lives of their children if they could afford not to be until they were grown. It was an old adage, children were not to be seen and not to be heard. But the great reformer, Martin Luther, and his wife, Katie, they presented an entirely different picture. They recognized what Scripture taught about children. They are a gift, a gift of God, and appropriate in their childishness. Their six children they raised on their own, educated on their own, and they were always around and present in the house. Visitors to the Luther's house who would sit at the table with Martin Luther to talk about important political and theological things, talked about how they were constantly interrupted by the six children running around like crazy. The Luthers loved the chaos of the children in their home. They thought it was a gift of God. They modeled for their culture, their society, what God has always intended. That children are to be loved and cherished. They are to be seen and they are to be heard. In ancient Rome, if a child wasn't wanted, the child was thrown out to the trash to die. The children were not wanted because they were in some way deformed. Tragically, if it was a girl, because they didn't want girls, they wanted boys. Or because there were just too many mouths to feed. Early Christians in Rome would go to the garbage heaps and rescue infants and take them and raise them. These were the first orphanages. Why did not anyone else in Rome do this? 
because no one else had the Word of God and took it seriously. They took serious what Jesus said in Matthew 19, suffer the little children to come to me. They took it literally as a command to their lives. And so they took the children in, provided for them, loved them, and raised them. Small children would be cherished, whether they're babies, toddlers, preschoolers. They should not be forced to be little adults. Small children are to be welcomed, loved, nurtured, protected, and taught. They have developmental tasks that they must complete because they serve as a foundation for all of life. But they have to have help completing them. They have to have adults in their lives. Such is each one of us before God. We come to Him in salvation as infants. And as infants, we are utterly dependent upon Him and others to feed us the truth of His Word in ways that we can understand so that we can grow to be like Christ. Grow in maturity through being taught, through being discipled, which is to be disciplined, through nurturing and through mentoring, we grow to be mature followers of Christ. Just as the small child is loved and disciplined, taught and nurtured and mentored, and learns to be a responsible adult. This is how God ordained life should be. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, you've given us the opportunity to grow and we have a responsibility toward one another. We have a responsibility toward our community. We're to help nurture people, help point them, train, disciple, and discipline, just as we do our own children and grandchildren. That is what you've called us to be and to do. But it all begins, the journey always starts with an act of faith. The faith in trusting in you and asking Christ to come into our lives and accepting the forgiveness that you give us in him and the new life you give us in him. For that we worship you and we praise you and we humbly ask in your name that you will help us each to grow and be all you want us to be and help us each as we help others to grow and be what you want them to be. For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.